I am saved. I am gloriously, robustly, and soundly saved. Today I want to talk about salvation. It's what a great subject it is. And I hope we can settle some things, make you sure of what Jesus Christ has done for you in your life. And if you're not saved, that you find that, that it's now the time to believe in Him. It tells us in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And it also tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do we believe that the power of God is powerful? Absolutely. So we're gonna settle some things hopefully today for you. There is one thing and one thing only that sends you to hell. That is not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. Everything else is forgivable and can be changed, but not believing in, on the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior cannot be undone. So we, we either do or we do not. But when we do, we are soundly saved. It is not fragile, it is not weak, but it is strong and it holds. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture here, but you need to know that we have standing and we have basis for what we believe. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19, it tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled him, us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We are a new creation. We have a new nature. Our sin nature is changed for a righteous nature. We have the gift of righteousness. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, I am saved and it is our sin nature that has changed. If I don't understand that, then I'm going to think that every time that I sin, oh, I'm now a sinner and I'm unsaved. So now I have to get saved again. And so we come back to the cross and we get saved. And then we sin and then, oh my goodness, I'm not a Christian. I'm a sinner. I've got to come back to Jesus Christ. No, no, we are a new creation. It's not a matter of just um, our sins being wiped away. He has made us a new creation through that. Imagine Adam, when God created Adam, and he was in the garden, and every day or whenever, God would come down to visit with Adam and Eve. Then one day, God came and Adam wasn't there, where he was used to fellowshipping with him in the spirit realm. Imagine Adam created in the likeness of God. His spiritual eyes were open. He could talk with the animals. It, it must have been an incredible time. Of course, he had nothing to compare it with. That was his world. And then when Adam fell and God came, he said, where are you? It wasn't because God didn't know where he was. Of course he knew where he was. But Adam was not where he had always been in the spirit realm to meet God. He had now fallen and was in totally a physical realm. So imagine this, here's Adam, who was able to see in the spirit, talk with the animals, and, and now he's fallen. So the demonic creatures that you know are there, that you saw before, you no longer can see. Because now your spiritual eyes have been dimmed and he can't see what he once saw. Imagine that, I can't imagine what that was like. So God, when Jesus came 
and gave his life for us, came to restore the nature, restore us to fellowship with God. I know that we hear a lot of times, and, and I've heard plenty of sermons that talk about that sin separates us from God. If that statement on its merit were totally true, we could never get saved. Because if my sin separates me from God and keeps me from God, then how can I ever come to God when I'm sinful? And if God is the kind of God that leaves me when I've sinned, that's when I need him the most. That's when I need his leading and his guiding to direct me and give me truth that I can come out of where I've fallen. And so our sin nature has been changed. We need to understand that so we're not going back and forth. I'm a Christian, I'm not a Christian. I'm a Christian, I'm not a Christian. In fact, we used to have a minister friend that uh, he used to say that the Holy Ghost was in constant flight because the dove of the Spirit would come down and lay, land on him and then he would sin and, the, and the, the dove would ascend again. So that is not the concept or the truth that we need to have because it's not the truth. When the Holy Spirit comes to abide in us when we get saved, he comes, the word says, to abide forever. He is not a um, flighty friend that at the first sign of trouble he leaves. No, he's there to be with us through all things thick and thin. When we talk about God versus the devil, we're not talking about equal opponents. God is the greater and Satan is the lesser. So who do we want to follow in life? I would hope, and I certainly want to follow the greater, not the lesser. But when we talk about, well, you're either ser serving God or the devil, we make it sound like they're equal and they are not. Satan is a created being. So he certainly is the lesser. So they are not equal. So we have to wipe that out of our minds. From Adam on, every man, woman, boy and girl that was born, which creates every baby, is fallen. It's their nature. It has nothing to do with sin committed, but has everything to do with their nature because how it could be fallen. So in talking about God and Satan being equal, God actually is at a disadvantage because every person that's born is already in the devil's camp. But he cannot hold us there. When we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, those scriptures we read in the beginning in, <clears throat> in Corinthians and Romans, it is the power of God that sets us free that we can be set free from sin and to walk in the glorious kingdom of God and his righteousness. I wanna read Romans 5, out of Romans 5, talking about Adam and Jesus. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him, Jesus, who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. Listen to that. The free gift of salvation and righteousness is not like the gift of offense. For if by the one man's offense, Adam, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, Adam, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense, Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, Adam, judgment came to all men, 
resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, Jesus, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, Jesus, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 5, 12 through 21. The offense is not as great as the gift. The way that we, for the most part, hear sin preached about, it would seem like sin is a sure thing. Sin is solid. Sin will hold you. Sin has no choice, but it's got you. And, oh, you know, if, if you can just eke it out, if you can hold on, it's weak, but your salvation may flee you. No, 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 no. Salvation is sure. We have to know that what Jesus Christ did for us is sound, that it's strong. It's not fragile. It's not brittle. It's not going to break. We have to purposely walk away from it. In fact, I, years ago, I heard somebody ask a minister, how can a Christian be unsaved? And this was his answer, which I thought was phenomenal. Someone is unsaved the same way they get saved. They have to believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is not Lord. Not, not just confessing. Because, you know, we've been through this time where kids could divorce their parents. Okay, does that make them not their parents? Of course it doesn't. So you have to believe in your heart and confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is not Lord. So if you're not doing that, and if you get to that point, you don't care. So we're not worried about that. There's only one thing and one thing only that sends you to hell, not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know when I heard that the first time, I was like, what? And then I began to think and I thought, that is absolutely true. And yet we've been afraid and we hear too many sermons preached to us Christians about sin. And if you're doing it, stop. But Jesus Christ, it is phenomenal what he's done for us. It is phenomenal what he's done for us. The children of Israel sinned, of course. We know that. The Bible tells us that they are the examples to us. But you know what? The children of Israel did not have a sin problem. I mean, they sinned. They had a blood problem. The blood that they used, the blood of bulls and goats and lambs that they came and they, and they offered up daily and continually for every little trespass was temporary. It only covered their sin. And so the next time they came, they had to come back and they had to offer again, had to offer again, had to offer again. Why? Because the blood was not perfect. The blood of the bulls and goats was just a substitute and it only covered their sin. But when Jesus Christ came, the perfect lamb, the one and only, and offered his blood, it lasted forever. Let's remember that when the, the children of Israel were under the old covenant, they were not made a new creation. The Holy Spirit did not dwell in them. And so therefore they are an example to us, but not in all ways. We are under the new covenant. When Jesus died and resurrected, the new covenant was put into place. He was the perfect lamb. Let me read to you out of uh, Hebrews 10. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. That's us. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Hebrews 10, 10 through 12, 14, 17 through 18. 
if I come, if I've come to Jesus Christ and I have repented, and then I go back and say, oh, I've got, he's going to say, what are you talking about? I washed that away. But the enemy always wants to bring it up and bring it back to us. If I am not receiving the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then I'm in trouble because God accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice. He does not accept mine. And it was 2,000 years ago, and in <clears throat> Hebrews 9.22, it says, without the shedding of blood, present tense, there is no remission of sin. So if I don't receive the sacrifice of Jesus Christ from 2,000 years ago, there's nothing here today being done. It was already done. And the, as we know, the wages of sin is death. There's a penalty for it. Jesus died not only for me, he died as me. And so therefore, because Jesus paid the penalty, sin has a penalty, and either Jesus paid that penalty for me, or I will have to pay that penalty. I want to receive the penalty that Jesus paid. It was gloriously done. It was graciously done. It was wondrously done. And we received that gift that he gave us. So what we need to do we need to become blood conscious, not sin conscious. When I do sin, I go, Father, forgive me for that. I know that I am forgiven because it was done 2,000 years ago and I receive that forgiveness, that blood that cleansed me. Now I'm gonna go forth and I am the righteousness of God in Christ because I am forgiven. But our sin consciousness comes from the accuser of the brethren. I'm going to say, I'm saved. And the accuser says, no, you're not. Nothing happened. I'm going to say, no, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And he's going to say, what? Don't you remember what you did? What you think? How you spoke? I'm going to say, I believe what Jesus done for me. Did what? What did he do for you? And so he's always coming to us. You see, he wants to be our God. He wants to, us to meditate on what he says. He wants to tell us if and when we can get married, not get married, have children, buy a house, go to school, get a new car, whatever. He's the one that wants to determine when that's going to do that to happen. He also wants to determine when I live and when I die. That's not his. That's God. He's my creator. He has my life and my destiny in his hand. And so we believe what he has said. The word says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. What does impute mean? <clears throat> it means to attribute righteousness or guilt to a person or persons vicariously, a scribe as derived from another. My sin was imputed to Jesus. Therefore, my sins are not being imputed to me. They were imputed to him. <clears throat> and his righteousness is imputed to me. It was the great exchange. He got the bad end of the deal. He took my sin. He took all that deserved to be punished and, and have eternal death, not eternal life. See, when we die, we're either going to have eternal life. And if you don't receive Jesus Christ, that doesn't mean you just go into unconscious is nothing. No, then you live an eternal death, but you don't die. It's just eternal. How horrible. I wouldn't wish that on my greatest enemy. I mean, it never ends eternal, but we have the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I love this in Hebrews chapter two, verses one through four. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's a great salvation. Do you really realize that when um, Jesus died on the cross, that the handwriting against me was also nailed to that cross. All the things that, that were charges against me died and were nailed to that cross along with him. So there's only one thing that sends us to hell, not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And there's only two things it takes to get saved, to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. Not, not confess our sins, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I think a lot of people have confession and repentance mixed up because they, they wanna tell everything they've done and yet continue in it. Well, then that's not repentance. My dad used to say that your steering wheel is the greatest repenter there is because it causes you to turn directions. That's what repentance is. So when I've truly repented, I've turned away from the sinful behavior and what I was doing, and I now act differently. I think we all know the scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall, have, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The old covenant dealt with the nation. And when Jesus came and he died in the new covenant, it is for individuals. It deals with me individually. He came to the Jews, to the lost house of Israel. But the new covenant was ushered in by his blood, death, and resurrection. Recently, I heard someone talking about repenting for ancestors. We cannot do that. I can only repent for myself. How can I turn away from my ancestors when they're already done? However, I recently heard a story of a minister friend whose grandmother had come to live with him when he was a small boy. Their, his grandfather passed away, so the grandmother came to live with him. And every morning she would tell their fortunes at the breakfast table. This is not a godly activity, by the way, in case you need to know that. So I can see where he could repent for this because that is a door open to the demonic. So therefore repenting would be we're not gonna have that going on in our family anymore. A door was opened by an ancestor, but we're closing that door, no longer going to allow that to happen. So I can see where we can do that, but I can't take care of their sins. They answered for their own sins. I mean, that was taken care of in the Old Testament that God said, it's not gonna go down the generations. A, a man pays the price for his, own, for his own sins, not for the sins of his children don't pay the price for him. What I wanna leave you with today is this, that our Christianity is strong, that our righteousness from Jesus Christ is generous and it is shed abroad and comes over all of us as we walk in Jesus Christ. It goes back to Adam and it goes forward all the way to the last person that will ever live, that that was what Jesus Christ did for us. It's a strong work, a work that will not be destroyed, and you can have confidence in what Jesus Christ for, did for you because you are a new creation in him. Now, if you do not know Jesus Christ, today's a great time. Why wait? There's no reason to wait, but it is a great time. Jesus Christ died for you because God did not make hell for people. It was made for the demons. So he does not want you there. And there's nothing that you have done that Jesus Christ cannot forgive. Can we pray? Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that anyone that's listening, that wants to come to you and receive the work that Jesus Christ paid on the cross for anyone that would receive it, that they could receive salvation in their life. And God, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your love. And we bless everyone that has heard this word today. We pray for revelation to go off in their hearts and their spirits and them to be confident that they are strongly, robustly saved in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, our contact information is at the bottom of the screen and just drop us a line, let us know how God is ministering in your life. God bless you.